All right, we're going to continue with uh, tensile and compressive stress. So when you have an object that is in tension or compression, um, the net force on it is zero, but the object can actually deform. Um, so the tension can cause something to be elongated or compressed, um, depending on <clears throat> depending on uh, the forces that are on it. So um, an object bending downward experiences tensile stretch. So it's being stretched in the upper section and compressive st stress. So it's being squished in the bottom part. <clears throat> As an example, often um, weightlifter, when weightlifters, um, Olympic level weightlifters um, lift iron bars, the bar will bend temporarily um, and objects under um, bulk stress tend to decrease their, uh, always decrease the volume um, uh, and the forces perpendicular to the surface act in all directions. Um, so the net effect is to decrease the, um, is to change the total volume. Um, so here you can see an example, a hydraulic press. Um, you push a piston, um, when a piston is displaced downward, the pressure on the oil is throughout the oil um, and causes the large um, piston to move upward. Um, a small force applied to, this, to a small piston causes a large pressing force, which, it, which the large piston exerts on whatever object. Um, so you can actually use this as a lever. Um, and then you also can have shear stress, which is when things tend to bend um, left and right. Um, so if you have two, um, two forces in opposite directions or anti-parallel, then uh, they're going to deform, the, thing, the object is going to shear. Um, and shear deformation is characterized by a shift in the layers tangential to the forces in the direction that is tangent to the forces. Um, so here you can see a stress strain plot from metal under a load. Um, and the graph points to, uh, to the fracture point. Um, so the arrows show the, the, the direction of, of the changes in an ever increasing load. Um, and you have some linear limit where the stress is proportional to the strain, but at some point the object becomes, the, the stress becomes versus strain becomes nonlinear until it eventually breaks. We often in intro classes, we'll talk about this part, but not, not talk about this part until we, ex except for qualitatively. And then I'm gonna move on to some examples. I'm going to, Go through as many examples as time permits. <laughs> it's almost bedtime at our house. Um, so here, <clears throat> this is a problem I like to <laughs> to give um, with the um, a whole bunch of tensions that are in equilibrium, and I'm just going to outline qualitatively what you should do for each of them. Um, there's there's a few different ways that you can do this, but the way that I like to do it is to treat each of the um, each of the vertices as a single point. And then, so in most cases, you really only have to worry about one um, point, but here you have three vertices. And then you have, um, you have, you can draw um, free body diagrams for each of them. So if I start with this first one, tension one goes in this direction, tension two goes in this direction. Um, technically, I guess I have two free body diagrams um, that I have to worry about, but and tension three goes here. This guy is pretty easy um, because I just have tension three and the weight. Um, so I know 
in that case that tension three is equal to the weight. So then I'm going to draw, I'm going to write out each of my equations, tension three, I'm going to use, draw my coordinate system, x, y, tension three, if I do the second free body diagram first, tension three minus um, g, I'm actually going to put these, so I'm going to write the magnitude followed by a unit vector <clears throat> equals zero. That tells me from this equation, tension three equals mg. And then I move to the second free body diagram. I have tension three negative y hat. And then here, this is 45 degrees. I have tension two cosine 45 degrees x hat plus tension two cosine, uh, sorry, sine In this case, they're equivalent, but I like to be pedagogical, as you know, that is the point of teaching. Pedagogical. T2 sine 45 degrees, um, y hat, and then minus T1 x hat equals zero. So here, I draw my, I have my x hat components. I'm going to pull them out and I get t1 and set them equal to zero. So I get t1 equals t2 cosine 45 degrees. I do the same for the y components. And I get t3 equals t2 sine 45 degrees. Now I already know T3 um, is equal to mg. So T2 equals mg over sine of 45 degrees. So T2 equals the square root of two times mg. I can plug this back into here and get T1 equals two um, times, equals the square root of two times, um, uh, not the square root of two, T2 times the cosine of 45 degrees, which is one over the square root of three. So this is equal to MG. So there I've got all of my, <laughs> All of my components. For each of the successive ones, you would do the same thing. There's some tricks when you get to this guy right here um, because there's some symmetry. So uh, you don't really have to consider these two vertices separately. <laughs> and you can use some clever geometry tricks as well. I never like to count on myself being clever and seeing some trick, I try to come up with some sort of um, algorithm which helps me solve it. And you're always fine taking these as free body diagrams and breaking it into pieces. Note here, we didn't really have anything obvious rotating. So it wasn't obvious. We didn't use torques. Um, we just used, it, used the net force. All right. Oh, that was not what I wanted to do. I want to flip back to. I want to flip back to my slideshow.
not going for public for a professional production just going for good enough for my students all right so here this is an example where you have um a structure at point p in equilibrium we're going to do the same thing now here <clears throat> it is you here you're going to want to use torques um <clears throat> And this one is not as bad as it looks if you use torques because you have a moment arm. I'm going to call this F1 and R1. And here you have a moment arm. And I need the magnitude. Let's see the force applied, I need to know when the structure shown below is supported at point P, it is in equilibrium. Find the magnitude of force F. I don't have force F. So we are assume so we are told there is a force F. Um, I applied it P. Um, I copied and pasted and garbled some of the um, equations. We're gonna draw a our standard coordinate system. If we plot apply a force F at point P. Um, let's see. Yes, so here, this one, if you look at the torque, um, you're not going to have a torque from the force F. So we're going to assume that F applied at P is in the Y direction. And it's supported at point P. So any rotation is about point P. R1 cross F1. Here's my Z axis. R1 cross F1 is out of the board in a positive Z. So this is 4,000 Newton meters Z hat. Now, R2, F2, the only component that so that matters is the component perpendicular to F2. So this is R2 perpendicular, not I. Just the component perpendicular is one meter. So this one is R2 cross R2 cross. F2 is into the board. So it is negative 4,000 Newtons Z hat. So the net torque is zero. Um, and that you didn't, wasn't, it wasn't a given. If I had just made up numbers, that would not necessarily have happened so nicely and neatly. Um, then we have to consider the net force. So the net force is easy. So the net force is going to be, <clears throat> ah, and actually I had drawn this assuming that it was all gonna be in the Y direction. It's not, so F1 plus F, two plus our unidentified force has to equal zero. So our unidentified force is equal to negative F1 minus F2. <clears throat> so it's just gonna be negative, oh no, so sorry, 2000 
newtons in the positive y direction and then minus 4,000 newtons in the x direction. So our net force, let me actually, <laughs> has got to go up and over. So this has got to be our net force. If um, we hadn't been, if the torque net torque had not turned out to equal zero, we would have had to do a lot more. It would not be a given that, um, that this would work out at all. And then here you see a slight variation on the same problem. And then it uh, it's the you have an additional force added, and you are to find the net um, the net force that you have to apply at p. Okay, here you have a seesaw um, balanced at its center. I like this one. This is a delightfully simple problem. Okay, so R1, F1, standard coordinate system, R2, uh, F2, R1 cross F1 is in the Z direction. So here our net torque is M1 R1 Z hat. And the other boy has a net torque that's in the negative Z hat direction. M2 R2 Z hat. So M2 equals M1 times R1 over R2. So the first boy is 40 kilograms times two meters over four meters. So the second boy is 20 kilograms. What's nice about this type of question is that it's very clean and simple. And you got to understand torque, but it doesn't get you bogged down in a bunch of details. And OK, here, a uniform plank rests on this, a level surface below. The plank has a mass of 30 kilograms and it is six meters long. How much mass can be placed at its right end before it tips? All right, so we're gonna have a mass M. Now here, we are going to calculate the, oh, it did a straight line for me. Didn't want that one. We're gonna calculate the, um, the torque about this point and then our center of mass is going to be three meters from the end but it's going to be dead in the center so we're going to have our center of mass here which is still 1.2 meters from our pivot point standard coordinate system x y Z, and we have, I'm going to call this mass of the board M. So we're, and this is, I like doing everything in variables. So we're actually going to call it M1 and R1 again. And this is M2, and this is R2. So we have the net torque is 
M1 R1 G positive Z hat minus M2 R2 G Z hat. <clears throat> and this is equal to zero. So we can solve for the second mass M2 equals M1 R1 over R2, which is 30 kilograms times 1.2 over 1.8. This is equal to two thirds. So you can put 20 kilograms on that. All right, and this is where I'm out of time to make the video. So this is where we're gonna stop um, and we'll see you guys for the next chapter.